Hello, I'm Elizabeth Cohn Stentz, and today I'd like to offer some strategies to cope in difficult and uncertain times that I hope you'll find helpful. These strategies come from a forthcoming book that I've co-authored on coping with cancer that's based on dialectal behavior therapy and neuroscience. Although our book is about cancer, effective coping is, le is actually less about the particular event that's happened than how we react to it, what we think, what we feel, and what we do. Take a moment to consider the situation we're in right now with this pandemic. It's certainly a trying and uncertain time. Many of us feel more of balance. Maybe we feel more grief, worry, or anger than ever. And these strong emotions make sense. We're having to adapt to a life we couldn't have imagined and would have never chosen. We aren't living, working, or connecting to others in our usual ways. Life feels less predictable, and we don't like what we can't know and control. What's really important right now is to remember that our reactions don't necessarily mean there's something wrong with us. Many of us feel more vulnerable, isolated, stressed, and more on edge right now. It's natural to want to feel safe and secure. We all want to be safe. We all want to be healthy. We each cope in unique ways. Our genes and previous emotional and medical difficulties shape our style. Some of us are more emotional and may even overstate danger. And on the other end of the spectrum are those of us who tend to be more fact-based in our thoughts and may tend to understate danger. Whatever your style, the good news is there are ways that can help you cope more effectively. My co-author, Marshall Linehan, was named by Time Magazine as one of the geniuses and visionaries whose work has transformed our world for developing DBT. DBT stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and it includes concrete skills that have been proven effective to cope with challenging situations. The D of DBT stands for dialectics, a 50 cent word that means that two things that seem to be opposite can both hold important truths. So what does this have to do with dealing with uncertain and difficult times? When we're stressed, it's very easy to stay on one end of the seesaw, reducing things to one way or the other. We make things very black or white. Dialectics makes it clear that it's possible to think feel or act in more than just one way. Life is not simply good or bad. You are not simply emotional or logical, strong or weak. It's possible right now to be both terrified and to do what needs to be done. While none of us is always in a balanced place where we respond proactively, staying calm, the key to effective coping is to do our best to look for an ideal middle ground between being so emotional that we panic or being so logical that we deny the need to take action. Let's take a closer look to understand the factors that go into our coping. Our coping system is impacted by our emotions, physical responses, and thoughts, which simultaneously influence each other and our actions. In immediate danger, all these factors work together effectively to generate a stress response to motivate protective action. When a lion is in front of you, your stress response to fear causes your heart rate to increase, your muscles to tighten, and you run. This stress response tells your nervous system that it's important to be on high alert. And after the lion leaves and danger passes, Ideally, your body returns to a more routine, balanced calm. But what happens in difficult and uncertain times like now when we remain worried? In this case, it's much harder to maintain our balanced calm. The distinction between fear and anxiety is useful to understand here. Both fear and anxiety stimulate the same bodily sensations. The heart rate increases, and we're a bundle of tight nerves defending our existence to mobilize us to do something to protect ourselves. The difference is that fear is a response to something that's happening immediately, right now. Anxiety is about something that could happen in the future, and anxiety often includes repetitive, worried thoughts about what might yet happen. 
anxiety can mobilize our body and thoughts to be constantly preparing us for protective action that is usually not necessary or helpful, whether or not the danger is immediate or still in front of you. Neuroscience has taught us that we're predisposed to be anxious. The mind has a biological bias towards negative thoughts. The caveman could not afford to mistake a venomous snake for a stick. So his mind was predisposed to see anything that was shaped like a snake and constantly believe he needed to take action because his life was in danger. Believing there's an ongoing threat, our body can maintain the stress response, creating chronic physical tension as armor to prepare us to fight. Bathed in stress, the nervous system can overload, sending a continuous, uh-oh, danger, message that we need to fight, flight, or freeze. The continuous frightening thoughts and stressful bodily reaction can set off a vicious cycle, like a gas pedal being stuck down. So the more anxious we are, the more distressed we may become, the more distressed we feel, the more things we may be worried about. The more frightened and anxious we feel, the more stressed our body remains. This stress makes it harder for us to think clearly. And we aren't thinking clearly. We may try to calm ourselves by doing needless things. That's maybe when we start to hoard toilet paper or overeat, or maybe we even start reaching out to others at those times. So what can we do? This overwhelming situation is similar to what happens with an overloaded electrical circuit. When the electrical circuit breaks down, the, uh, it shuts off the electricity and everything stops working. With an overloaded electric electrical system, we look at the circuit breaker to see what change triggered the problem. Similarly, it can be helpful to take the time to pay attention to the overload of our coping circuit to figure out what parts may be contributing to the problem. The remedy is to stop. S, slow down and pause. T, take stock by doing our best to be aware of our, what we're experiencing right now. O is for observe, to pay attention and identify our physical response, our feelings, our thoughts, and our impulses to do things. And P is to proceed mindfully, to consider ways that it's possible for us to rebalance. Let's break that down. The S of stops helps us to avoid impulsively doing things, such as being short-tempered with people we need to rely on, or doing other things that are not in our interest. The T stands for taking stock of what's happening because we can't really change how we cope until we face both what's actually happening and how off balance we are right now. But this isn't as easy as it sounds. We sometimes fight painful realities and uncomfortable changes. We don't particularly like what's going on. We, sh we wish we didn't have to accept the way life has changed. Who wants to face the way our life has been affected right now? Whether we like it or not, Change is constant in life. The bright sun rises in the morning. Later, clouds may cast a shadow. Dark storm may arise, and we may forget the sun ever exists. Perhaps later the sun reappears, and at the end of the day when the sun goes down, again and it's dark, we may, we may not remember it was ever light. As we will see, our emotions, bodily responses, and thoughts all ebb and flow as well. It's going to be important to stay open to seeing those changes. The O of stop is observing. Observing our physical responses helps us manage fear and anxiety. We want to take time to be aware of our heart rate, our breathing. Is there tightness in our head, throat, chest, or belly? Sometimes we notice anxiety when we pay attention to our posture. Maybe it shows up in our digestion or our body temperature. The goal in observing our physical responses is to pay attention only to where and how the emotion is expressed in our body without focusing on our thoughts right now. Next, we want to observe our, our emotions. That's easier said than done. We can fight our emotions. They have a bad reputation. 
negative ideas about feelings can keep us from accepting them. We may think that emotions will overwhelm us and should be avoided. Perhaps we believe being emotional means we're weak. The fact is, attempting to, a, to control emotions can increase stress. Research has shown that understanding and identifying emotions reduces their intensity. It's important to understand that our feelings are not static and physiologically shift after 90 seconds. It's very useful to pay attention to the initial emotional sensation because it offers quick, nonverbal, valuable messages about the safety of a situation and can motivate protective action. For example, our fear will tell us it's important to escape from danger and anxiety is a message that we need to respond and act on our worry. Our anger may be a signal to protect ourselves against physical or emotional threat and our sadness may be a sign that it's useful to reach out to others for support. After 90 seconds, the initial emotion will continue if it's held or intensified by thoughts, actions, or bodily sensations. And the ideal is to, to let those emotions flow naturally. Next, we want to observe our thoughts. Are you ruminating over the same points over and over again? Are you overemphasizing danger right now and imagining the worst, that there'll never be enough toilet paper or money or that you may die? Are you seeing things as one way or the other, black or white? Have you decided you're strong or weak, that you're in control or totally overwhelmed and powerless? Are you concluding that something's wrong with you? Many of us can personalize the understandable sadness and anxiety we all share in this situation and decide the problem is us, that we're coping poorly, that we should be less anxious or distressed. Right now, it's very easy to make assumptions. There's so much inconsistent information and so many facts that are still unknown. Our assumptions can include judgments, which are our opinions about what we like and dislike, and maybe res responding, we may be responding to societal ideas that we should be less frightened, calmer, braver, or more upbeat. Either or thinking, labeling things as one way or the other doesn't consider a larger perspective. And it might lead us to believe that fear is simply destructive and miss the constructive motivation that comes from the emotion. Unproven ideas that are not based on fact can increase fear, hopelessness, anger, sadness, or our stress and cause us to be harder on ourselves or lose faith in our ability to cope. Perhaps we start to turn away from how we do feel to how we think we should feel. You also want to be trying to observe your emotions. Can you notice whether you're doing things in the moment that are costing you in the long run? I found myself doing some serious overeating. Others realize they're drinking a lot of alcohol. Try your best to be aware whether you're dealing with loneliness and a wish for contact in a more constructive way. Are you reaching out to others when it's in your interest? Are there times that you tell others you're fine instead of how you really do feel? The good news is there are lots of ways to rebalance by changing how you deal with your emotions, thoughts, physical sensations, or actions. After you've observed and labeled what's happening and your reactions, it is possible to restore a more natural rhythm to your nervous system. Let's go through the possible ways to do so. Labeling your emotions has been proven to rebalance your nervous system. The adage is name it to tame it. Although it's not always easy to say how you're feeling, identifying the emotion does help you calm yourself. Some of these common words listed here to describe fear may be a helpful guide. Changing your physical response can also help you calm yourself. Try using your breath to slow down your rapid heartbeat because it activates the part of your nervous system that can promote calm. What you want to do is slowly inhale to a count of four. One, two, three, 
four. And then take a longer exhale to a count of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're trying for an average rate of about five breaths per minute. Focusing on the physical touch of your senses can also be a useful way to ground yourself and keep you from overthinking. Take a moment now and see if you can bring your attention to the feel of your feet on the floor. Try to be aware of your sit bones as they touch the chair. As you breathe, you might consider gently putting your hand on wherever you're feeling the tension. Perhaps that's your chest or your throat or in your belly. It's also possible to calm yourself by going through your body and tightening each of the muscle groups and then relaxing them. You might start by gently stiffening and tightening the muscles in your forehead as you do that inhale for a count of four and pay attention to the tension for about four or five seconds. Next, you want to exhale for that longer six seconds, saying relax as you soften the tension till you feel almost like a rag doll. You want to repeat this by scanning your entire body, going from your forehead, eyes, cheeks, jaw, all the way, all the muscle groups, all the way down to your feet. Checking the facts can also be a valuable way to balance assumptions, judgments, and the views that things are not really merely one way or the other. Are you panicking now over information about the virus that may or may not be true? Have you made certain assumptions that aren't accurate? Do you believe that you'll never find toilet paper or that going to the grocery store will totally contaminate you? Are you accepting your opinion of how you're handling things as a fact? Notice whether your judgment that something is wrong with you overlooks the fact that we're all more on edge and vulnerable right now. Dialectical thinking helps you take a fuller view of the situation. Two seeming opposites can both hold truths. A more complete view of life includes joy and sorrow, light and dark, both exist. Understandably, in dark moments, it's difficult to remember the joyful, positive sides of life. Yet it is possible to rebalance by keeping in mind that we go back and forth between dark and light. Desmond Tutu says hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness. It may be useful to keep in mind the touchstones that remind you that change is always possible. Is it seeing the shades of orange in the sky before sunset? Or feeling the soft touch of a new baby's skin or a pussy willow before the blossom? Maybe for you, the sa that sound is a more effective cue and hearing the opening chords of a piece of music reminds you to be helpful. Whatever are your cues, try to keep them in mind. Also try to remember that the full story includes both positive and negative parts can be very helpful to help, to help you regain equilibrium. It's useful to remember that joy and beauty do still exist in the world. Recognizing that our stress can be both constructive and destructive is also valuable. The fact is stress can be threatening and challenging, and it's the challenging part that moves us to work harder and reach out for help. Studies show that people who see the full story about stress, the downside and the upside, are less anxious, depressed, and more resilient, trusting themselves to rise to the occasion. Self-talk can also be a useful way to rebalance when you're doubting yourself. Research shows that the most important factor in our capacity to cope has been shown to be our faith and our ability to do so. See if you can find a kind and reassuring way to tell yourself, just because I'm scared doesn't mean I can't cope. I wish I didn't have the stress, but I can handle the pressure and rise to the challenge. I have strength, even though it sometimes feels hidden. Lastly, Rebalancing actions that give you relief from how you're feeling can be very helpful. Distracting yourself from thoughts can be useful when you're feeling 
too overwhelmed and uncomfortable. Try counting. You might simply start counting backwards, 100, 99, 98, or you might start counting your breaths. Some find it useful to count things like the amount of books in the bookcase in front of them or the bricks on the wall. Labeling is also helpful. Just as naming works to tame emotions, you may try grounding yourself by simply identifying what you see in front of you. I see People Magazine on the table. There's a coffee cup. There's an electrical outlet and so on. Soothing sensations are another way to make ourselves more comfortable. Relish some of your favorite tastes. Gaze out at the splendor of nature. Maybe the touch of a warm bath or lotion are soothing for you. Is listening to pleasing music the thing that brings you comfort? Doing things that seem opposite of the way we're feeling can help balance the painful parts of life. DBT refers to these as opposite actions. I wanna be very clear that I'm not suggesting that you simply act positive and just look on the bright side. I don't wanna minimize other feelings that really make sense. Those feelings need to be validated by observing and labeling our experience before we try to do anything that seems opposite of the way we're feeling but it can be valuable to remember and act on the positive parts of life that do still exist. When you're feeling down, it can be useful to rebalance with pleasurable, funny events. Throw yourself into an activity you enjoy. Go outside the sunshine, chat with a friend, watch a funny movie, share jokes. Humor can be terrific right now. There's a good reason for the expression, laughter is the best medicine. If you're feeling helpless, try to do things that give you a sense of what you can control. Developing mastery is, can really help you to feel more competent, complete a project, maybe clean out a drawer or do a puzzle, or even learn a new skill. At times when we're feeling so much has been taken from us, we might want to consider doing things for others. Contributing is a way of being active instead of passively remaining helpless. It's true that when we've lost so much, it can be really hard to appreciate the valuable parts of life. And it can be especially challenging to consider that there might be any gains at this difficult time. Yet, it may be worth our while to do our best to express gratitude for the positives that remain. One study shows that people who made weekly lists of what they were grateful for were much happier than those who just wrote down about ordinary events. It is possible that we may be able to find right now a renewed appreciation for what really matters and is most important to us. For many of us, it's our health and our connections to others. Indeed, it is possible to cope even in these very challenging times. Many people have used these skills. Try them out and I hope you'll see that you're capable of making a difference for yourself.